country of another ancient civilization, China, is a third great river with a long history of floods and disaster. The Huang Ho, or Yellow River, is correctly named, for it is colored with yellow subsoil that pours down the current from the barren hinterland. Hundreds of miles from where the soil erosion occurs, and for hundreds of miles along its course, the bed of the Yellow River is raised higher and higher above the surrounding country. In its lower reaches, the Huang Ho becomes exceedingly broad and shallow. The wide channel of the river is held back by dikes, and the river silt, which at one time spread over a wide area, is not concentrated on the river bed itself. Here the yellow waters are 15 feet above the general level of the plain. At high water, they are 30 feet above the surrounding country and at times of flood, the confining dikes are swept away and the river pours over the country. So frequently has this happened, and with so much misery and loss of life resulting, that the Huang Ho fittingly bears a terrible name, China's Sorrow. It too must just keep rolling along. In 1937, a terrible flood struck along the Ohio and Wabash rivers in the United States. One of the richest and most productive sections of the USA had to meet in its turn destruction, devastation, and disaster. Consider, for example, what happened in Paducah, a town of 33,000 situated where the Tennessee River pours into the Ohio. Early in January of 1937, when the rains came and the rivers continued their inexorable climb, the water stood several feet deep in many of Paducah's streets. On Saturday the 23rd, more than 9,000 townspeople had been forced to leave their homes. By noon next day, the rest of the country had no idea what was going on in the flooded town. Telegraphs and telephone lines were gone. Highways and railroads into the city were impassable. In the stricken city, there was neither drinking water, light, nor heat. By February 1st, Paducah was a ghost town. It was worse than a city sacked by an army. No friendly hand waved a greeting. No chimney smoked. Soundlessly, the gray-brown floodwater slid across the city, tiny wavelets plucking at the eaves of deserted homes and whispering through the crotches of submerged trees. Why are floods on this continent becoming increasingly destructive? All of us know that we can't blame the farmers along the Pembina Valley or the citizens in the town of Paducah, USA for the floods that have occurred in the rivers of their locality. Yet, it's evident that most floods are a result of man's disturbance of the balance which nature had achieved before white men came to this continent. The same conditions that cause dust storms cause floods. Lands can be denuded of timber only at a terrible cost. When struggling working men have rolled back the forests, then dust fills the hot summer air. When sloughs dry up, they no longer act as reservoirs for surplus water. When man has taken away forests, streams, and fiber-held soil, nature becomes ruthless and forbidding. It battles back with roaring waters, hungry for the lives and homes of men. Rains and snows come, as of old. But when waters fail to sink into the soil and flow to the rivers, then to the sea, more and more quickly, man does not receive a fraction of the benefit which the rains had to offer. Through drainage, clearing of forests, and plowing of natural grasslands, our pioneers increased enormously the amount of agricultural cropland in each province. But the results have not always been good. The worse erosion becomes in the hills, the more sudden and disastrous are the floods in the lowlands. Although we may not understand precisely the value of forests in controlling floods, we are certain that rivers are much more regular in their behavior 
if the upper reaches of the river basins are safely protected by a forest cover. The litter of leaves, needles, and twigs on the forest floor increase the absorptive powers of the soil. A high proportion of the rainfall is then transferred to the ground water table. This litter absorbs many times its volume of water. The water which passes to the ground water table reappears gradually from springs and other sources, thus giving the stream or river a more regular flow. When watersheds are deforested, the flow of a stream becomes intermittent rather than permanent. Streams from deforested and eroding watersheds carry tremendous loads of silt, whereas water flowing from a protected watershed is largely free from silt. It would probably not be true to say that a forest increases rainfall, but it does help to make the moisture more permanently available. just keeps rolling along. A river, whether it is the Tigris, the Nile, the Yellow River, the Ohio or the Pembina, is an unthinking, uncontrolled force. It simply pours down its valley, following the laws of gravity, caring no more about the people along its bank than about so many frogs. The Pembina could no more help overflowing its banks once the unprecedented rains had swelled it than a rain barrel could help overflowing once it was full. It's a tremendous task, however, belonging not just to one section, but to all of a country, to see that not too much or not too little water enters one of our rivers. Science knows fairly precisely what principles must be adopted to stop soil erosion and floods. Success will come when enough people understand the need for acting together to make floods and droughts impossible. Alberta Science on Parade with a presentation of the Department of Education. The script was written by Nancy Thompson of the Correspondent School Branch. Your narrators were Jim McRae, Frederick D.L., and Richard MacDonald, all of CKUA. This is the last program of this series until after the new year. So till then, we wish you one and all a very Merry Christmas and a happy and prosperous new year. Old man river, old man river, he must know something, but don't say nothing, he just keeps...